This is the Empower Podcast. Released January 18th, 2021. Episode 526, sponsored by Mauser Electronics. Why IoT is difficult with Jonathan Berry. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Jonathan Berry of Goliath. Welcome, John. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you, Chris? Good, good. Uh, I, I'm going to start off the episode here. We're going to try and build a complete end-to-end IoT device, including cloud, by the end of this episode. How do you feel about that? Uh, terrified, <laughs> uh, but also, you know, good challenge. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're actually... So we were talking about before the show, like, well, what, what did you say about companies and, and like their capabilities on like even well-resourced companies on like standing up a IoT product? What, what do you, what do you, how, what's your take on that sort of thing? The space of IT is so hard. And so if you're, if you're a company that's well-staffed with electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, embedded developers, and cloud engineers, it's still, still a struggle. It's taking a couple of <laughs> years to get a product, product out. It's still a hot pile to get that it's thing out. It's still a hot yeah. pile. Yeah. Forget security exploits, but just to ship the thing. And so imagine you're not like it's 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 even harder. So I don't yeah. think the two of us will, will get this done okay, in well. an hour. Well, here's here's the thing. You'll do the hardware. I'll do the website of things. And I'm, we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll see what happens, you know. <laughs> what could go wrong? Right, right. Two minutes later. What makes things so hard about that whole process? You know, like the when you have, you know, at least one person in each of those those uh, pieces, why is it so hard? And maybe what's the scale that uh, the scale of deployment that you're talking about? Well, you know, in general, what makes IoT both interesting and, and I think extra challenging is that it's a system of systems. So you have to become an expert in embedded and you know, security and RF and you know protocols and cloud and mobile. And even if you are staffed, right? <laughs> like yeah. you can just imagine uh, the handoffs are a problem, but no one of the companies sure, sure. is experts on the intersections. And so if you're building, let's say, a web service, right? So, Chris, your responsibility in our, in our company, uh, mm-hmm. you have to both understand. <laughs> yeah. A little build... take here today, apparently. <laughs> it's, it's all good. Uh, okay. Hopefully, you don't have any deadlines from our investors. But Right, right, right. In the meantime, like, if you're building that service and you're doing a software update, right, you know how to write that software on the back end side, but you actually have to understand how the device facilitates mm-hmm. its software update, how it does a handshake, how it communicates back and forth. So you actually have to understand firmware while you're designing the backend system. And so yeah. every part of, of building an IoT product requires understanding at least the, the seams between, between, between the systems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I guess may, maybe in a best case scenario, what is the fastest you've seen one deployed? I mean, like, like successfully deployed? Well, there's, there's also in the industry a lot of commercial off-the-shelf solutions, right? Mm-hmm. If, you, if you want to build a asset tracking thing, Assuming that your thing is well understood, like a shipping container or a, a big rig, you can buy a solution and and ship it in weeks. Uh, you can go to a you know a domestic vendor, uh, you know a Chinese ODM who will white label however you want. Uh, but of course, that becomes a commoditized product and, and sometimes right. a scary, a scary looking right, product. Right. But if you're if you're starting from scratch to the complete extreme, like you're doing chip up design and you're trying to figure out your your functionality and capabilities, a couple of years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Even in a well-oiled machine, we, we can talk about some of my experiences at, at Nest, uh, new product introduction um, could be you know, 12, 18 months mm-hmm. very comfortably. Maybe for, the, maybe for the use of discussion here, we should come up with a fake example. I mean, we could use, we could use like the ABC board that I'm designing as mm-hmm. like a hardware example, but even that's not really, that's not specific enough to an application. But let's say, uh, let's see, I used an example of like a, Forest fire tracker. That's what mm-hmm. I want to use recently. Where it was like, okay, this thing's cellular. It's got a temperature monitor. It's got a part- particulate mon- monitor and something on there. It's got a what else did it have on there? I don't know, like a wind sensor or something like that. You know, like some kind of way to detect these things. And now we're going to try and build this thing out, right? So hardware's done-ish, let's say. Yep. And we're starting to get it to talk to the network and all those other stages there. So like, what else is, what else is involved there? I mean, you, you'd mentioned, you know, we talked about the firmware already a little bit and the hardware a little bit, but like kind of what's, what's on the, the other side of that 
internet wall that we should be thinking about. Yeah, and, and actually, if if you're a product company, you're probably going to start at uh, even earlier than that. What is this thing supposed to do? Who are the people trying to use it? And this is where you know product thinking comes into play. Is there a mobile app? Who's the user? Who's mm, the yeah. who's the operator? Who installs it? And, and you have to actually understand kind of those requirements pretty early on because you, have, yeah. you need to figure out: Do we even need a mobile app? Do we need multiple yeah, mobile apps? Yeah. And right, right, right. The the hardware is definitely a, a core piece of that, but it could also have dependencies on those other decisions. Like, does this yeah. thing need to be software updated? Some things don't have to be software updated. Right. If you have like field technicians with an SD card, they could push a new update by just popping in a new card or something like that. Yeah. Or if it's using Bluetooth beacons and it's programmed once with a very fixed piece of information that never needs to change, then mm -hmm. all you got to do is look and stick and put it everywhere. So again, <laughs> like you can, you can build your requirements from the sort of features that your product needs to do. But let's say the, for the, uh, fire monitoring, uh, forest fire monitoring system. We know what those are, and and it's you know uh, a ranger needs to use it, a, a firefighter needs to use it, and maybe some some technician who comes and checks it infrequently. You have your hardware. Well, it, you have to write some software for that hardware, most likely if it's going to be yep, doing yep, anything yep. interesting. <laughs> so you got to figure out your your software story, right? Is it going to be programmed uh, at the factory? Is it going to be programmed by a technician? Is it going to be programmed over the air? Is it going to be programmed over the air from the cloud? Is it going to be programmed over the air from a phone? And so you already start to, to get oh, the firmware okay. engineers in and start to think about, well, what's what's the firmware architecture? How, what's our security model to get the firmware onto that device? Mm -hmm. what, what do we need to be the back end for that new firmware? So if you're not doing right. that early on, you, you, you basically have to wait until you move past that, that sort of phase. Mm. Unless you're companies who don't do that in time. <laughs> well, I think some of it too is... is the assumption here is that this is at scale in a commercial context. And it's not like, you know, like, so one thing that I've thought about in the past is like, oh, well, you know, we could, maybe we could push that off till later. And it's like, yeah, you sort of could, but, but then that, that could have very detrimental effects. If you don't remember to do something, you don't remember to put in the, you know, the DFU button or something yep. simple yep. like that, or well, even probably more complicated than that. But, you know, like if you don't have it in place, you could really screw yourself down the line. Yeah, and I think all those things can be a lot leveled up into product requirements because mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned DFU button, maybe it's a, a line you wiggle, maybe it's a chip you have to insert in the, si in the side of the device. And mm -hmm. <laughs> on the hardware side, that has direct implications of the hardware because mm -hmm. uh, you might have to design that into the, the physical device, any, any, any form of security that goes associated with that, that particular thing we're talking about. But then the software side, did you, did you plan for enough flash to do a software update? All right, yeah. Right, right. Like double, double the amount so you can actually put like a second image on there and check it against one another and that sort of thing. Exactly. Or is it uh, a module that you uh, include into the side of the device that's doing the, the software update, like a USB stick? Mm -hmm. But also the, like, the software that goes in with it. What's the bootloader? Uh, how do you update the bootloader? Uh, how does the bootloader interact with whatever's providing the software update? So if it's over the cloud, is it doing a secure boot kind of thing? Mm-hmm. So a lot of those decisions have to be made, uh, but they don't have to be all made at once, That to, to be fair and, and to be sure. And if you mm -hmm. offload some of that to different types of platforms, you, you don't have to make those decisions because they're made for you. Yeah. But as you go in your design process, you definitely have to be sort of thinking those things as, as early as possible and not something yeah. you can just push off forever. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think, yeah, like you said, I mean, if you pick a platform, then you could you could maybe at least lean on that for the time being, but then you might run into a constraint later where it's like, oh, well, we don't want to be paying for every device or we we can't you know, do the update the way we want to or need to. So yeah, there's, there's definitely, you kind of have to think further down the line. And it feels like companies that are coming in that don't understand, that haven't done hardware in the, in the past as well, it's like there's some rude introductions to a bunch of, bunch of new topic areas. Oh yeah, and that's that's been the trend, right? For for half a decade, where software companies have realized that hardware is really useful, and so they're mm -hmm. trying to add hardware to their software, uh, which is it's it's just rude awakening for sure. Everything mm -hmm. from you know manufacturing, processing, uh, lead times. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how hard could it be to add a, a Wi-Fi thing to our to our mobile app? Right, right, right. right. So. Yeah, and, and and also platforms are not just cloud platforms. If you talk about the hardware side, you could be using a bare chip, you could be using a module, 
You can be using a platform, a cloud platform that also includes a hardware platform piece, like a, like a mm -hmm. vertically integrated solution. So if you choose the, the platform, it could be it mean different things to different parts of your product. But yeah, if you use a module, it probably already has prefixed firmware, or it could have an existing bootloader that you can't really modify, um, mm, which yep. makes things easier. Or truly a, a integrated end-to-end -end hardware cloud solution that, like, here's how you program it, here's all you can do to program it, have at it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, so one thing that I, you and I had a chance to have a socially distanced meetup relatively <laughs> recently. And one thing I remember from that is, like, we were talking through this ABC board, which I've been working on. Mm -hmm. And you would give an example of further up the chain now, right? So uh, mm -hmm. now we're trying to, I have a cellular modem, I'm talking to a network and then there's some MQTT endpoint, whatever. And I mentioned like, oh, well, I figure at some point I can like stand up an AWS IoT instance and have an MQTT broker on there and have, you know, throw stuff at that, throw, you know, messages at that thing. And I was like, well, most people could do that. And one of the examples you brought up was the fact that some companies are like, so now all of these things are all assumed, but one of the, you challenged one of my assumptions. It's like, well, you've seen a company that says, we actually, we use Azure, we use Microsoft. We have to be built on mm -hmm. Azure. And so now if there's anything in that chain that is based on AWS, it's like, well, that's that assumption is wrong. Yeah. And so could you talk about like the, the reliance on uh, certain vendor solutions and like the assumptions around that? Yeah, especially when it comes to this, solution around cloud, right? If you, it's almost as, as, as important and, and integrated into your product as your hardware, right? You, you, just, you couldn't just swap out for a different uh, wireless radio uh, chip uh, in your device. You, you couldn't right, right. Make, make it a lower module like just overnight, right? And in some right. ways, once you pick a, a cloud partner or a cloud solution, it's, you're baked in. You're not moving off of it for a long time, years. Yeah, and right. That has implications, right? Uh, maybe they have features that you can use right away, but features that you want in the future, they may not add. So a particular protocol is not implemented. So you can't benefit from, let's say, different trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Or like you're talking about, there's a lot of companies uh, that are in the uh, commerce business that choose not to partner with a company that does commerce as well as cloud hosting. Uh, oh, right. Right? Like, <laughs> right. So you're saying Walmart wouldn't use AWS IoT or something like that? that that's, that's probably a, a, good, a good bet. But yeah, yeah there, there's, there's business reasons. So if you go to, to them and say, hey, we have this device and it's hosted on Amazon, they're like, well, you got to move it off. Yeah. I mean, I, and I've seen that in, in my career for sure. Mm, um, yeah, that's, that's messy. <laughs> yeah. So it's the technology might be different or like incompatible with what you want to do, the sort of business relationship, or if you're if you're in China, right? And you need to have Chinese oh, sure. users, right? Like you can't use Amazon AWS in, in, in China. So there's a lot of things to think through about picking a, a partner there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we've su sufficiently uh, framed the problem that uh, IoT sucks. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> sucky things here. Uh, let's take a step back. And so what is, what is your experience in this whole industry? Like we're... How'd you get into it, and how how did you start learning about all these sucky things that happen in IoT? <laughs> well, uh, if we want to go way back, I I always wanted to be in hardware. Uh, I wanted to build robots, uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'll go to school and study study engineering, and it was all math, so I I, I did the easy route, which is computer science. Oh yeah, everybody thinks no math and computer science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until all this machine learning stuff pops its uh, ugly head, uh, but. I so I worked in 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 more of the software world, but always in, in sort of hardware and hardware adjacent stuff in my spare time. And I was at Google for a bunch of years, uh, and we tried to do things. Um, so I was I was on a team um, under Android called Firebase. It was an acquisition, and they made it really easy to build mobile apps. So it was trying to simplify the mobile uh, development story. And we tried to build Firebase for Arduino. And that was really uh, mm. a good lesson of how. Trying to build a thing that was meant for one type of hardware doesn't necessarily apply to another type of hardware. So what does that actually mean, Firebase, for Arduino? So if you think about, uh, this is, like again, before there's a lot of other options out there, but um, Firebase was doing a database, it was doing identity and, and, and sort of identifying users. Uh, it had ways to push notifications. So we said, oh, what if we just took that, make it work on a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth-based device? with a really easy to use SDK, because that's what was our bread and butter, mm. making the SDK Got so it. easy and the cloud just needed to figure itself out. But yeah, trying to trying to do that at that time was was 
a challenge both just from we were a cloud team building cloud software and knew a little bit about the mobile SDKs and knew nothing about embedded software. Just mm, anything it, related to hardware was so foreign to us. Got it. And that actually inspired me to, to look around. And I joined Nest uh, just after the acquisition, specifically looking for a hardware related type role. And that's, that's how I got into IoT and, and kind of been my career uh, ever since. Mm, yeah. And so what was Nest like? I mean, so this is right as, so Nest was an independent company. It was Tony Fidel, is that right? Yeah, Tony Fidel, yep. Yeah, yep. right. And so then it got bought by Google and then that's when you were there. So were you actually working on like the low level as it as the multiple boards got merged into fewer boards? I remember, <laughs> I just remember like a teardown being, people being like, there's like four or five processors on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're Hardware procurement and planning was 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 super interesting and and uh, that's separate. Like they put they put sensors in their devices two years before they had software that could use it, just knowing that they would be able to use oh. like lidar like sensors and, 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 and for presence detection and stuff like that. Super super interesting. Uh, yeah, I joined uh, on as a, as a product manager working on the comms team, so that's communications, and it was the embedded software team and. Uh, they had proprietary technology for communication and our own stack, you know, our own internal standard, if you will. And part of becoming one with Google and, and trying to drive the smart home industry, they said, well, what if we spun this out into a standards body and open sourced or opened up, I should say, this, this networking technology. And so just before I joined, they, they formed a thread group um, for this technology that was called Thread, mm -hmm. still, still is. And I was the PM for that internal stack, as well as working on the standards body. And we realized that the standards bodies are slow. So Tony, <laughs> what? <laughs> Tony's like, this is too slow. Let's open source our stack. Like, mm -hmm. okay, can we, can we do that? Uh, so yeah, so I was the PM for, for what became OpenThread, which mm -hmm. is the widely, probably the most widely used version of, of Thread. And, and what is Thread? Because I've heard it before, but I'll play the dummy here. But I, yeah, what, what is it? So uh, all Nest devices that have a thread radio in it, so it's a, it's a type of radio, create a mesh network. And that's a long discussion of what is a mesh network, what isn't a mesh network. But effectively, every device can talk to each other. Uh, they can talk to each other reliably. So it's not Wi-Fi. It's not cellular. It's not Ethernet. It's its own backbone network for your, for your IoT devices. And it's, it's unique in certain ways. It's, it's optimized for power. It's um, pretty good bandwidth. So you can actually do some interesting things and it's self-healing, so it's super robust and reliable, almost you know, as close as we can get to uh, wired networks. This kind of was one of the intentions. But it was also wireless. And the design was specifically to reuse existing uh, modems that you can buy off the shelf. So it actually used the same radio that, that was found in Zigbee. Mm -hmm. And so widely deployed across all Nest devices and now in a bunch of other products um, since then. But mm -hmm. effectively, you as a hardware creator could take the thread uh, spec and implement your own version, or you can take open thread and just create your own wireless mesh network. And yeah. so it's low level, it's closer to Wi-Fi than it is you know, browsing Netflix, if there's, if there's a fair analogy there, but it, uh, it's what powers Nest products and, and what I worked on. Got it. So just going up from the bottom, it's like a 2.4 gigahertz radio, is that right? Yep. Yep. Running 802.15.4, which is yep. like the protocol. And then this is a layer on top of 802.15.4. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. okay. It, there, there's the, the OSI model uh, for networking. Usually you have seven layers, maybe sometimes five, but it's kind of the middle. It's just above mm -hmm. IP networking. And so you could use it as a primitive to create your own protocols on top of it. Mm, got it. So Nest created its own proprietary protocol, which is now actually being evolved into more of a standard. Uh, you could use MQTT on top of it. You could use CoAP, um, a bunch of other things. But it's the mm. it's the sort of lower level that you don't have to worry about, like like Wi-Fi, right? We don't think about mm -hmm. using Wi-Fi uh, yeah. as uh, when you're designing your your web server or whatnot. Uh, it's just just similar. You don't have to think about thread underneath. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's great. That's great. Okay, cool. That's great. That's really cool. So yeah, I mean that and that gives I mean at least insight into your experience around. Yeah. Yep. building stuff at that level of, you know, on device, obviously. And then, but then thinking through these different layers of the stack and like understanding how things are going to be connecting ultimately up to the internet. Yep. And yep. so when you say something is running thread, it doesn't necessarily mean it's already connected to the internet. It really just means it can talk to other devices. So how does a, th how does a thread device ultimately get to the internet? 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, by design, it doesn't have to. Right, yeah. If you if you look back to the early days of what is what is IoT, right? Machine to machine, it was all networked devices that had no internet connection. And so yeah. uh, I actually have a thread network in my house that's not connected to the internet just, just because. But the then you have a gateway. So okay. there's yep. well-defined uh, standards that are used to bridge the thread network to something else. So in a Nest thread network, your you know, camera or your, your actually your thermostat would bridge all the devices to the internet. And so that's how it can communicate the state to Nest backend, to your mobile app, or through the backend, to third parties. So if there's a, they have a security system, when there's an actual intruder alert, they, they call a security monitoring company directly, uh, things like that. And so mm. uh, you now have to, if you were talking about implementing something like that, you have to understand not just the thread technology, uh, if you're trying to use it, but then the gateway technology and then bridging between one protocol to another and and uh, managing networks. And it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Yeah, no, it definitely sounds like it. So do you, is there like a, a great, is there a good reference platform for people that wanted to play with that sort of thing? So like if they wanted to go stand up a thread mesh in their house today, is there like a chipset that is well supported for it? Yeah, yeah. So OpenThread uh, is the name of the open source implementation. And that's what a lot of people have been um, globbing onto. So OpenThread.io, we can finish throw in the show notes. Google has b- released a bunch of tutorials, interactive and uh, as well as hands-on around the Nordic chipset. So NRF52840 uh, is, is probably the gold standard, actually both for the Thread group and for, for OpenThread as a project. So you just get a couple of, of um, DKs from, from like DigiKey. Uh, I mean, why stop there? Let's get an ABC board. That's what I'm running. So <laughs> nice. I got I have one of those parts on boards. That's that works out well for our example here too. Yeah, and, and you might get the DKs for the like the low end sensors. Maybe you want to have a battery powered motion sensor, window sensor, and then you could use the ABC board as as the gateway that mm-hmm. manages yep. all those devices and and beats backhaul. Yep. Okay. Cool. 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 Okay. That's great to know. Yeah. So so then. So now the ABC board is running as the gateway, right? It's talking over open thread to a bunch of tiny things. Mm-hmm. When it does, so now it's throwing packets over uh, cell modem to somewhere on the internet. Mm-hmm. You're saying that that would actually be doing that with, now Now it's not doing it with open thread. It's actually throwing packets like TCP packets, UDP packets, MQTT yeah. packets. Is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. So the one of the responsibilities of that of the, the ABC board would be to translate the the low level of thread, you know, thread bits into something that would something else, but it's all based on IP, so internet protocol. So mm-hmm. it's easy to go from thread to let's say TCP or UDP. So oh. I, I, I think the tutorial you might find on the Open Thread website. It's been a while. It might be MQTT and talking to Google's MQTT service. And so those devices are just speaking MQTT, and all that's happening on top of the thread network. And then when it hits the ABC board, it's relaying that um, as a standard you know, M- MQTT TCP uh, packet to, to Google. So you can actually build an end-to-end oh. demo that way. Got it. So you're saying that like the little window sensor would actually be also throwing an MQTT packet, basically yep. saying like the window's open or window status equals one or something yep. like that. Yep. yep. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yes. So it, again, the analogy of Wi-Fi kind of works here because if you're just going to be sending an MQTT packet over Wi-Fi, you don't really think that it's you don't think much about the Wi-Fi or the um, TCP stack underneath. You just think of the MQT library you're using, and that's one of the design goals of of Thread itself. And you know, probably a good design goal for a lot of protocols. But you don't have to become a protocol expert to use it. And so yeah. you can you can invent your own. You can you can call it the ABC protocol, ABCP, uh, on top of on top of Thread. <laughs> right off the tongue, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say I was good at naming. Okay, that's cool. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's interesting too, because now, so then after you were at Google working on open thread stuff, you went to particle and yeah, they were yeah. also doing some mesh stuff as well. Yeah. So, uh, I worked on the, the embedded platform, um, which included also hardware as well as the embedded software. They were looking at thread before I was there. And when I joined, they were like, Hey, you want to help us do this? So yeah, we worked on an open thread based generation of hardware as well as I worked on the cellular stuff too. That was, uh, that was growing. We went from. 2G, 3G to Ken M1, the, mm-hmm. the glorious yep. uh, journeys of... Uh, <laughs> the glorious hot mess of the <laughs> R410B. Yeah. Yeah, you, this is a, a U-Blocks modem that I also had some experience with, and it's it, it was very shoddy at the beginning on the U-Block side, and they got better, but they were not good at the beginning. <laughs> this there was a, It was actually a perfect storm of technology. Mm-hmm. There's Qualcomm, who makes the chip. 
Yep. There's Ublox makes the module, and then there's the you know Verizon, AT and T, whoever is the carrier. Mm-hmm. When when we were working on the the sort of that generation of um, LPWAN particle devices, all of those were a complete hot mess. So mm-hmm. Qualcomm forgot to implement some features. Ublox <laughs> couldn't it said it was working in, in their SDK, but it wasn't because it wasn't implemented in Qualcomm and. Uh, oddly enough, the rollout of, of 5G, which is basically what CAT M1 is, uh, was not even a thing, even though it was supposed to be fully rolled out globally, right? Uh, yeah. So we had things where our test devices would work in uh, Minneapolis and not in Chicago. And they send someone <laughs> up a tower, uh, uh, figuratively, and it was just running different software. They forgot yep. to do a software update to their own networking appliance. So of yeah. course it wouldn't work. Yeah. Yep, yep. I have I have stories like that as well. It's uh, it's jarring when you're staring. You're like literally looking at a cell tower, and you're like you're looking at your phone. You're like, well, I have four bars of four G LTE, and then you look back at the tower, and you look at your device that's supposed to be talking to it too, and it's like, nah, I don't see anything there. <laughs> it's like, uh, what's that in Westworld? It's like, I don't see anything. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's a great analogy. Yeah, it, and it's it's. The cellular world, as as you know, is is super complicated just just to understand. And mm-hmm. if you're trying to implement hardware and validate that hardware is working, and you have no, but you have no control because you don't own towers, uh, or they're mm-hmm. really expensive to to own. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you're just staring at that West World. I don't see anything here. Yeah, um, so it's yeah. even it's even a harder form of IoT. Well, that's what it is. It doesn't look like anything to me. That's yeah, what, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. they say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That's uh, that's that's crazy. So uh, so. You'd worked on the the cellular stuff there and the uh, the open thread stuff there. Yep. How long were you at Particle for? About two years. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So worked on the beginnings of the the I think third generation hardware. So it was moving from ST to to Nordic, doing the thread, um, the mesh particle mesh uh, hardware line, as well as the the new cellular stuff, mm-hmm. and a bunch of tools. Um, and I got to go to Shenzhen for the first time, which was uh, mm. exciting and yeah, riveting yeah. in both good ways. And that was also when uh, Particle bought Red Bear, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, we, we acquired Red Bear because we knew we wanted to beef up our electrical engineering team, our RF team, um, as well as bring on specifically Bluetooth uh, expertise. Mm-hmm. Because, mm-hmm. Of course, besides doing Thread, the Nordic parts do uh, Bluetooth. Right, right. Well, and you guys already had a great... Uh, uh, Mohit is your double E, was your double E and still, yep, he's still yep, there. Uh, yep, yeah. Yep. Wonderful double E and really fun to follow on Instagram. If people haven't followed him as well, he does the uh, circuit sculptures that are amazing, but, uh, yeah, that's interesting. The, what, what was Red Bear doing prior to the acquisition? Well, Red Bear had their own, uh, maker developer community. So there was, there's a lot of, uh, alignment of, of who particle, um, was as a company, you know, really strong in, in sort of hobbyist and, and getting, um, sort of beginnings of products on board. Um, and they mm-hmm. did the same thing for Bluetooth. So uh, ah, got it. They, they had the, the Red Bear Duo, I think, was their, their most popular product. It was taking an Arduino-based framework, making it really easy to program because they, they beefed up the Bluetooth stack mm, yeah. and you know, easy to breadboard kind of hardware. And then they had a Kickstarter that was successful. So um, it was very much the sort of spiritual twins uh, on the Bluetooth side yeah. from, from Particle. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And then from part, I, I think we'll come back to particle too, because I think that'll be interesting, you know, using them as an example of like, so we, we'd already kind of talked about like choosing a platform, right? So particle mm-hmm. would be like a platform that some people yep. choose and there are some definite benefits to that. And there's some drawbacks as well. And we yep. can talk through that when we get back to that side of things, but let's keep talking through your history here. So what was after particle? Uh, I, I took a little bit of time off, not, not too long. And I joined WeWork, which, uh, speaking of WeWork, uh, <laughs> everybody loves WeWork. <laughs> Uh, I may have given John a little bit of hard time when he joined WeWork, but it was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know, uh, it was it was fun when I, when it started out. So a lot of the the last three stories we talked about. So when I joined Nest, it was very strategic. I wanted to learn about embedded and and networking and protocols, and I, and I joined Particle because I wanted to learn hardware and manufacturing and what it takes to 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 create a physical device. And so I I ultimately decided to join WeWork because it was in the IT space. We can talk mm-hmm. more about that. Surprisingly, yeah, but yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, would you be surprised how big the budget was? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would not be surprised by that part. Go ahead. Yeah, was, <laughs> but I wanted to actually learn more about the cloud side because at the, mm, the yeah. even though I had background in software and and, and working on cloud services, I really didn't wasn't involved in the the cloud part at Nest or the cloud part at Particle. And so this is an opportunity to to really understand what it takes to you know start from the beginning and design infrastructure for connecting to physical devices. What are the design trade-offs? 
and you know getting to some sort of scale, which which we actually end up doing, which was cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think for all of my uh, jokes about WeWork and you know rest in peace, we we work and uh, 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 but I think the thing that is there is and and one of the things that you and I talked about have talked about in the past is just like it's a it was a lot of sites. There was just a lot of workspaces, yep. and when you think about every every door lock that's there, every sensor that's in every building, that it's just like that that really does scale pretty quickly. It's like basically. Yep. It is a closed ecosystem because they own, they run that whole thing. But it's like, yeah, there's a lot of devices there, and I, I guess maybe maybe Nest got to that same scale after you had left, but you were at the early days of Nest, and now you're basically walking into like a already connected ecosystem yep. and trying to optimize. It feels like, yeah, and, and uh, Nest grew really fast. Uh, even when I was there, uh, when a, a Nest customer bought a single device, they were likely to buy five more. It was just sort of that kind of. Uh, oh, wow. growth. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some really interesting stats about, I think, just early adopters of consumer IoT. Mm-hmm. Yep. The WeWork was interesting because it was a very different set of challenges. There were 600 buildings when I was there, and WeWork didn't own most of them. So that's mm-hmm. part one. Part two, most of the hardware that went into those buildings were predetermined you know, five years or more before WeWork even existed. So we had yep. to integrate with existing hardware. Oh, uh, yeah. We had customers that had their own set of requirements. So when a you know Pinterest would you know basically rent a floor from where we work, they would actually have to they would have to say what goes in there, as you can imagine. Oh right, right. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of push and pull. It seems like from internal and external customers. Yeah. So so the area that I focused on the most was physical security. So you walk through um, the front door. If there's there's probably a door person or um, a, a turnstile. And you have access to get into that somehow. So you get through that that turnstile, then you enter the elevator key or scanner QR code, depending where you are, and it takes you to the exact floor. And then you walk through a front door, probably through a front desk, but then a front door that has some sort of lock on it. So turnstiles, elevators, and door locks are three different systems, which we wish we could own end to end, but we didn't. <laughs> right. Right. So now it's dealing with external constraints because you don't actually own the hardware anymore. Exactly, and and have no say of even changing it. So the turnstiles was probably picked before they broke ground. The elevators came after and are shared somehow um, among different tenants. And then oh, yeah. door locks are, are are actually controlled by us. And so mm-hmm. we wanted to build this experience, and this is what the experience is like at WeWork, uh, where you walk through the front door, you go up to the elevator, and you go to the, the conference room you just booked all in real time. And... When I say that in real time, it sounds like a you know it's a software problem. It's a mobile app and some database or, or whatever. But actually, it was a thirty-year-old turnstile system that uh, it has a very, very legacy way of integrating with it. Then you had to somehow know that that person was a WeWork uh, member, and then somehow unlock the turnstile. Then you have to go to an elevator and know which floor this person is associated with to have access to. And then unlock a door lock, which is using yet another system. So we built uh, custom hardware that kind of interfaced with all these different systems. Um, we brought our own vendors in. So um, we, we use proxy in a bunch of locations, which is a, a startup that does door locks. We worked with our tenants and said, hey, can we just shove this giant card in the back of your, your machine that is costing you, <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of dollars? Trust us. because uh, we're, we we're, we're basically hacking you, but you know, you know about it. So that's cool. <laughs> but... You know that's a, that that's sort of one layer, but the problem is we have all these different systems. We have physical aspects of the world, like the box that controls the turnstile was made in the '80s, and you can only yep, do yep. Um, one command per second. And so, <laughs> when it, uh, this is an example, when um, let's say a, a tenant comes on board and they have a hundred employees, regardless if they have hundred employees in that building or hundred employees around the world, we have to update a hundred records just in case uh, you know the employee comes and visits the office. Well, mm-hmm. that means you have to do one employee entry in that turnstile per second. And so when you have tens of thousands of people onboarding and offboarding all around the world in, in multiple locations, you basically are creating a um, denial of service attack on this little tiny box. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, what, that's another thing that surprised me about what you were telling me about this is that because of the speed that all these things happen, so now like you need to have local like access control, you need to know, yep. you know, user one, two, three, four, five, six is enabled to go through that turnstile because that turnstile is not able to go and say like, oh, someone just beat me with their code. Now I need to go and check. Is one, two, three, four, five, six allowed through my my turnstile? 
20 seconds later, no, they're not. <laughs> or yes, they are. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's that's bad. And what happens when the building's internet goes down? Or what yeah, happens right, when right. the vendor pushes an update to their turnstile software uh, and it breaks the previous integration? So we actually in implemented even edge computing to, to offload some of that um, and keep things yeah. in sync. But uh, yeah, I got to build uh, that infrastructure um, effectively uh, from scratch and kind of understanding, well, the premises of running software in the cloud, where we control the servers on Amazon, and you know exactly how close they are, or how, how slow they are. There's, it's just a wild west. Yeah. And, and, and it, was, it was really interesting. There's other projects that I got to be, participate in, too, in, in building management, um, BMS systems for motion sensors and fire systems. Occupancy sensors for common places and uh, phone booths. So there's actually a lot of stuff going on that we work mm -hmm. to make the space even more efficient or you know provide more value to um, to members. Yeah, it's all using hardware. If I if I can kind of bring it all home with this stuff. So so John's experience so far has been like gluing stuff together. Obviously, we work. You know, there's the the hardware aspect, but also hardware and the firmware piece, kind of like how everything interacts from a piece of silicon all the way up to the cloud. Right. Uh, let's see. What else did Nest have? Nest had like the uh, the protocol stuff. Yep. So talking between devices and understanding how things will forward along messages and that sort of thing. And we're all getting towards what John's working on now. Right. This has all been a setup, folks. If you didn't know, this is a <laughs> setup. And so John's working on a new thing that's going to be about solving some of these problems and making it a little bit easier. It seems like. Is, yeah. That's yeah. What you're going for maybe sort of. Yeah. 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 Uh, definitely. <laughs> and, and I think I, I think part of it was. You know, uh, last last ten years building products, I even advised some companies, and just seeing the struggle of trying to get all this stuff out. And actually, yeah. a lot of the the space I'm in now is is more in the hardware world. And you know, you know, you, you know, you you trying to bring up an ABC board and building a product around that, or a you know, venture backed uh, IoT startup company, they have similar problems in that they're probably ex Tesla or ex Apple and they know how to do DFM and they have a CM and they know how to do, you know, in factory programming. And that's, that's where it stops. Like the, the thing yeah, is right. it works, you know, it, it passes all the, the red green tests and well, how do you collect the sensor data that you're promising to your investors? And how do you build the mobile app for the farmer right. to, to know that the water's actually been uh, um, flowing? And now you have to basically build a whole or, or not or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so now you have to basically build a whole new set of uh, skills. Yeah. And so the interesting thing about all this is if all those trillions of IoT devices are actually going to come online in the next mm -hmm. decade or two, they'll be built by hardware people and hardware companies. Yeah, at some at some point they're they're hands on with it, right? It's yeah. probably not not a white label, you know, hands off kind of solution because. That's not how companies work, in my experience, either. You know, not on scale. And it's also not a cloud company. It's not a mobile company that's like, oh, let's just add a little bit of hardware to our product to make it better. It's it's the yeah. John Deere's who know how to make tractors are going to make the connected tractor, not some startup, right. uh, you know, who's who has an idea of how to build the slickest UI. And so, mm -hmm. if you have to both be an expert, uh, in a hardware company, and know how to build really good hardware and hardware experiences, then also have to become a cloud company. Uh, it's it's that's the tough problem. <laughs> Uh, I believe I believe it actually is pretty easy. I said at the beginning of this, I'm going to be writing all the software here, so that's pretty easy, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, we're hiring, so. Um, ah, but right, right. No, it, it, it's interesting because if you look at solutions that exist, uh, you know, I can certainly talk about the places I worked at. Mm -hmm. They're mostly software companies, and said, "Well, everything's either a server or a cell phone, and we know how to connect to those. So, how mm -hmm. hard can building an IoT device platform be?" Right. right. And well, and when you say hardware too, do you do you mean embedded usually? I mean, like because, like you said, I mean, talking to a cell phone feels relatively straightforward. Obviously, there's a ton of complexity there, but but it feels like at least that's a device hanging off the internet. You know, like that's got a accessible, maybe not public IP address, but it has an IP address. It's got a you know, it looks like a computer, talks like a computer, smells like a computer, whatever. You know. Yeah, and and you know that that's a that's maybe like an interview question. Is this thing hardware? Um, or the other one is yeah. what's embedded software. Yeah, right. That's the uh, that's the lightning round over at Embedded FM. Right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and I think it it's all about the world. One, there's a physical device, and two, it has constraints. And when you're in the world of of cloud computing and, and mobile software, and you know building a, a web app for that matter, you really don't have physical constraints around you. 
And so I would argue that uh, you know the, the Raspberry Pis and other embedded um, single board type deployments still are closer to the have some of the problems of of building connected hardware like a microcontroller. Mm, yeah. You know, I, th- I think with the, is the ABC board uh, also a hat? Can it work on a Raspberry Pi? It is. Yeah. It's also it starts its life as a hat, and then the idea is you can break out the center part. So. If people don't know what I'm talking about, the ABC board, this is the board I've been talking about. Sorry, I should have said this at the beginning, but it's a board that I designed. <laughs> it looks like John said, it's it's a Raspberry Pi hat. It starts with, and the center section is an NRF52. It's got a BG95, which is a cell modem and you know power handling and stuff like that. But the idea is that it starts as a little, as a hat platform, and then it can become an embedded breakout thingy. Yeah, so let, let's actually take that as an example. If you just looked at the, the, the ABC board itself, it's got a microcontroller and it's got a, a wireless modem. That is, you know, kind of the, what we've been talking around a lot, right? An embedded, embedded device. Yeah, it's, it's it's truly embedded. It's not it's not running. I mean, it's running an RTOS now, but it's not like it's not running a full Linux stack or anything like that. But you you know you, you have to be really think about memory management. Your security um, risk modeling is very specific to updating that device or, or trusting who's talking to it. Well, lots lots of hard problems we can even go deeper in. But that Raspberry Pi also has some of those challenges. Like, how do you do a mm, yeah. reliable software update for a Raspberry Pi? That's right. Or yep. h- how do you make sure that the firmware that's running on the the NRF um, is the same firmware that's running previously? And how do you make sure that it doesn't break what's running on the, on the Raspberry Pi? Mm-hmm. Battery management is not a problem if you're plugging into the wall, but actually heat management is a huge problem. That's something that... Oh, uh, sure. Right. Yeah, if you want it to be like in- enclosed and sealed, it, it could, you know... The Pi could be like, nope, too hot. I'm shutting down. Yeah, a, a, a good example. The the Nest thermostats, uh, obviously, high precision temperature sensors in them, and they're calibrated. Well, there's a Linux computer in there, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. and uh, and a radio. So you had to actually build the, the team had to build basically timing software on the radio, so they knew exactly when it turned on because it created erroneous heat. That threw off the temperature sensor, so they synchronize the, the oh, sort of Linux wow. side, <laughs> the embedded side, and of the wireless stack, just so they can get the most precise measurement. So like, that is definitely an embedded system, even though it's running it's running Linux. And yeah, right. As opposed to building, um, let's say, on a general purpose operating system that already has some of those facilities figured out, like it's how you update software, how do mm-hmm. you install apps, and all the other sort of management pieces, and just gobs of of unconstrained resources. Yeah, that makes sense. Today, we're talking about a subject that has been brought up many times before in the Amp Hour, Risk 5 It's encouraging that our sponsor, Maser Electronics, is covering a new and impactful topic. I'll let them reintroduce themselves and the topic here. This is Paul Galata. I'm with Mauser uh, Electronics, and I'm a senior technology specialist. RISC V has been around for about a decade or so, but it's really, over the last year or two, propelled forward with, with a lot of interest. And we as a distributor are really seeing several of our suppliers that we engage with starting to come out with products right now. And so we want to share with the design engineers what exactly Risk Five is and what the groundswell moving forward is happening with, with why so many people are interested in making products. You had mentioned the company's getting interested in it. Why, why would you say that people should consider Risk Five in the first place? There's been a tremendous explosion over the last decade or two in, in mobile phones. And we can love the technology advances that happens proprietary, and we can love them as well when they happen open source. I think many of us uh, recognize the benefits to having some types of open standards where we as a global people all working together and collaborating can come together and go, how do we sort through the best ideas, the best practices that allows designs to be uh, done faster, to be more portable, for people to understand and invest themselves into one system and not have to go, oh, this company has changed how they're doing things and now I have to make a whole sorts of adjustments that maybe I didn't want to do. I asked Paul what this means for the day-to-day of using RISC-V components. One of the things that's happened over the last couple of years is that there's now a full software tool chain available. That means all the necessary resources are in place so that people can come in and grab those tools right now and use it, that you're not going to run into a frustrating experience where you go, well, uh, I'd like to do something with that type of open standard ISA, but 
I would have to do so much work on my own. So there's a whole host of people that have uh, gotten into the business to support these tool chains. And that makes it so that people can come in and start doing these open standard designs royalty free without having to pay, getting to use a common modular standard that's open, that's simple. How do you imagine that people are going to use use these kind of kits in development? Like what kind of industries are you expecting will we'll kind of take to these? Well, I think RISC-V sees themselves playing across the entire space. They care about applications, including 5G, consumer, edge, AI, enterprise networking, storage, cryptography, multimedia, and vision. So it's just really a whole host. Again, what happens is because of the barriers being knocked down by not having to have being locked into proprietary, all these applications that I mentioned are really really big hitters. These these are the, the, the 10 areas or so, along with automotive that is driving all the procurement of high-tech electronics happening now and expected over the next, you know, a generation of products and those type of things. To learn more about RISC-V, check out the Mauser's application page dedicated to RISC-V and all of the things we discussed here. Or go to theamphour.com slash Mauser, M-O-U-S-E-R dash Risk five R I S C V. And now back to the show. Yeah, so maybe we could start to frame this too. Like, so so you kind of already listed one of the things, which is like run a Linux system, right? That's one option. You have a device out the field. Hopefully, it's got a big enough battery or it plugs in the wall. It runs Linux. Assuming you don't have heat problems, you could maybe just do that. Hangs off the web, and it's got you know maybe some security issues because it is running a full Linux stack, but you know. Hopefully you're good enough at networking and all of the other things that you're you're good to go there. It seems like another option is the embedded route, right? I mean, mm-hmm. and we'll talk through that more. But I think there's an in-between option, which is something you did work on, which is basically buying an integrated embedded, mm-hmm. so like a vertically integrated embedded option like Particle, right? So that's basically buying the API to hardware in that scenario, it feels like. Yep, yep, definitely. And you know the the nice thing about Particle, Electric Imp, and a bunch of other solutions. Even maybe you go to contract someone to build a custom platform for you that you don't really have to to manage. Is you define your constraints, you define your requirements, and they give you a nice you know, bowling lane with bumper bumper rails. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> you you can work in, and that means you don't have to worry about a lot of those problems we just talked about to some degree. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so one of the, one of the things that is interesting about them is that they're moving into. So they've always had these, uh, like the solder down. You could solder down modules yep. from yep. them and stuff like that. And then now they're also moving into the B five twenty three, I think it is, which is effectively the same thing that the ABC board is. I didn't realize this until afterwards. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, it's like the same parts, but like it's a BG ninety five, or and it's got an NRF fifty two eight forty, and like basically it's it's a very similar kind of thing in a different form factor, and you can just buy that and plug it in. You know, your device has an M2 connector on it and you buy this thing and now you've basically bought an internet stack all the way up and down. Yep. And you know, that's there's a lot of benefits there. And and I would say that I, I continue to recommend Particle, especially to software companies who wants to add hardware to their product. It is yep. a no brainer yep. way. The the trade offs is is also part of the benefits, right? Well, the nice thing is there's a BG ninety five that's already routed and it's already uh, you mm-hmm. know tested. What happens when you yep. want to use a BG ninety six? Yeah, right. Or an EG91, which is the real thing, I think, because that's now Cat1 instead of Cat M1. And that was the reason that I didn't do something like that. I wanted, so they're footprint compatible, but I can't go and swap out that part Mm -hmm. on a B523, which is the module from Particle. So that ABC board actually can swap out for the footprint because I want to be able to get, you know, if you're, again, this is the example we were talking about earlier, you're staring at a tower, your cat one your cat m1 device is saying it doesn't look like anything to me but if you had an eg191 device it actually would know what that is because cat one is like your cell phone talks to the tower versus cat m1 which is a different software stack on the tower itself and you basically just summarized uh one of the core things that I, that we're trying to solve for which is hardware matters and so the fact oh, that yeah, you couldn't yeah. you couldn't just use um like an electric amp or a particle and and swap out that BG95 for a BG96 is one of the things that you know when I was at Google we didn't really get is that if you're talking to a hardware company the harder they choose matters a lot more than where this server is hosted or you know if this is a, mm-hmm. a, a yeah. B plus A or A plus B in the way you program it mm-hmm. and so without having if every if every company this is the sort of thesis of, of all this is like if every company is building these kind of products is going to be a hardware company and hardware matters so much then you really have to 
think about how you deliver some of those features, like not, in, not have to worry about security as much or, or having a way to do software updates, but with all, also having the choice on hardware. And so mm. there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to solve it, and some companies are resolving it. And that's where uh, this, I like to tell a story because I was on the Android Things team. And <laughs> how's Android Things doing these days? Is it still well, around? <laughs> it's officially deprecated as of, of oh, this month. Oh, sad. And so that, that's why I feel okay telling the story. We, you know, I was, I was on, on Nest and we we're doing stuff with Android Things. And they said, okay, let's take Android and slim it down. It's kind of like an IoT device. And so if we get it mm -hmm. to use a third of the resources, um, then we can reduce the hardware requirements and a third of the cost. Very, 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 actually a very technically um, impressive achievement. Mm -hmm. And we started to go with our BD team to, to pitch it to device manufacturers say, look, we have a cheaper Android. And some of them were lighting manufacturers and they look at this, this board and <laughs> see it's like, oh, in single quantity, it's only $90. <laughs> and and they, this is for the light bulb, you're saying? The light bulb, right. They're like, yeah, uh, our, our part cost, our bomb is 95 cents. So <laughs> Exactly. Um, it's it's a... Uh, I like to use this phrase, I'm, I'm stealing it from someone, but there's this impedance mismatch between how companies like Google see the world and how harder people mm -hmm. see the world. It's like, right, right. The, the, the lighting guys are looking at trying to do, you know, double layer boards whenever they can to save, <laughs> right? And, and you're going right. with this, this thing. So it was just funny all around, right? The cost of the, yeah. of the module was $95, not 95 cents. It couldn't physically fit into a light bulb if you wanted to. <laughs> right. It'll put off as much heat as a, uh, exactly. as a 100 yep. watt yep. light bulb, right? <laughs> and and that's that's sort of the the overall uh, recurring problem that companies that are trying to solve this, the cloud part, who are only thinking about it from the cloud perspective, just don't get. Like even hmm. the protocol you use and how you connect to to, to a device. Yeah, I, in a previous a previous role, I worked on um, the self uh, self uh, propelled uh, two wheeled uh, you know last mile uh, transportation devices. The scooters, right? <laughs> this is right. Who I'm talking about, and, and will be a lot more obvious uh, pretty mm -hmm. soon. But they actually built the first version themselves. So they got the scooters mm. from Xiaomi, and they got some EEs. They ripped out the board, and they built hugely scalable um, mobile apps prior to this. And said, "How mm. hard can this be? We have a, a scooter. It's got an internet connection. It's got a little cellular modem. We know how to build a server. So let's just make it happen, right?" Mm. Because they didn't understand, you know bandwidth and protocols and embedded security, they would use their entire monthly budget of, of cell data in one day because it was just so chatty and like not optimized. Right, right, right. Let me send back every bit of uh, configuration data and, and troubleshooting and everything else like that, right? <laughs> exactly. And let's use the same certificate we use for a mobile app. Well, that certificate uses all the RAM that's available on the device kind of kind of <laughs> set of problems, right? Right, right. And that's 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 the biggest challenge. If you are a hardware person, a hardware team, a, a you know an engineering firm, or a hardware company, you have to uh, either build this knowledge yourself, or choose from some of the, the companies who are just coming at it as a as a software problem, as a cloud problem. Yeah, yeah. It does feel like a majority of like work these days is not the majority of work is way overestimation, but but basically like trying to make other devices like what customers expect so like the number of times i've heard well my iphone can do this why can't my <laughs> industrial embedded device do this yeah yep, yep. it's like man like that thing that i know it costs six hundred dollars but if we spend six hundred dollars we couldn't even get close to what you yep, need to do yep, because yep. of scale because of constraints because of you know apple's got a thousand software you know, people doing stuff and it's a different type of computer, you know, like, it's just like, it's just a, like you said, it's a complete impedance mismatch on what is actually wanted and what is actually possible. And so, yeah, <laughs> that sucks. You're ta talking to a lot of, uh, electrical engineers and bed engineers. And, uh, actually have a friend who former mechanical engineer designed end to end, uh, acid tracking solution, uh, for his company. Uh, it's all, I have this thing. I know how to. I know how to, to program it. I know how to design the hardware that goes into it. And, you know, pick all the components. I just need a place to send some of my data, and I want that yeah, thing to yeah. work with my hardware and in the right. way I need it to work. And you tell me how to do software updates. Actually, well, I can tell you the the, the constraints of my software. Like I only have mm. so much bandwidth on this uh, M1 connection, or I'm over Bluetooth, so I can only do this kind of handshake. So either. You have to design your own end-to-end -end solution, which I can tell you, I've seen it. And it sucks. Like, yeah, <laughs> it sucks. And you better become a second company because it's a full-time gig or, right. or you make right. compromises. Yeah, and figure, figure out how to make money on that sort of thing too is also not easy. 
Yeah, the another another story that it's been long enough. Nest has a a door lock it designed with with Yale. Yale is the second largest door lock company, and it was mm-hmm. it was actually super cool. A lot of functionality. The hardware, the the de- let's call it the mechanically uh, finished components, and all the embedded software was done, and it shipped two years later. Oh wow! That was all because <laughs> the cloud infrastructure at the time didn't have the extensibility we needed, so we decided to extend it, and that was that was crazy. <laughs> and that's its own thing. And that's its own thing, right? Like to understand about scheduling and low power, ultra low power device, and like all these complexities. And remember, Nest had all this existing infrastructure already, and people, and have done hardware bring up before. So, just try to you know try to do it as a as a small company or startup is 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 really untenable. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as someone who is now starting a small company to do some of this stuff, John, why don't you tell us about your next venture? <laughs> yeah. Well, th- thanks for the segue. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're we're trying to solve this problem. I I'm really passionate about making hardware the right thing, right? Like building the right type of hardware. Not, don't make compromises. Don't use a module that, that don't work for the product you want to build. And effectively empowering hardware developers, electrical engineers, uh, firmware developers with a cloud that, that works for them as opposed to the other way around. Yeah. yeah so, and just, just to, to clarify on things too. So you said you think that hardware companies are going to build this stuff in the future. Do you think that it, when you say that sort of thing, do you think that if a cloud company is interested in building a hardware device. Do you, are you saying that, well, you should still think like a hardware company first and then use something like the solution you're going to talk about here? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, okay. if, if you're building a, a custom experience end-to-end and you, the hardware that you can't buy off the shelf doesn't exist, uh, you, should, you should become a hardware company or hire a hardware company or really partner with a hardware vendor that's going to uh-huh. design it end-to-end and be part of your overall story. And is that because of just because of the reality of like cost constraints and power constraints and stuff like that? Or is it just because hardware people are better? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ignore that second part, but you know, like... I I know what you meant. No, it's more, uh, well, hardware is hard if you don't know hardware, right? Like, I I love that phrase, hardware is hard, unless you're a hardware person, right? Uh, 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 Designing a PCB is hard unless you've been designing PCBs for 10 years. Oh, sure, yeah. Right? So like cloud companies have never designed custom hardware until they they eventually do. So then they, they become you know, the nest of the world, right? The, the hardware and yeah, cloud expertise right, right. in one. Yeah, it is learnable, it seems like. And it's, yeah, it's accessible. There's, yep. you know, it's more accessible than it ever has been, it feels like. But then, so then you start thinking like that and you understand the constraints and then it's like, oh crap, now we have to think about all that other stuff to yep. hook it into the internet, to hook it into updates and, and things like that. Yeah, and 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 to be fair, uh, there's lots and lots of companies who are software companies and they've partnered with, uh, uh, engineering firms, you know, engineers like yourself to design the hardware for them. And then they don't have to become a hardware company, but effectively they have the expertise in house. Um, yeah, exactly. They, they gain that gain it one way or another. Right. <laughs> yeah. But the opposite is also true, right? Mm. We're, we're working with this company They're in the agrotech uh, space. They monitor the, the health and wellness of livestock. So like horses and cattle. Internet of cows. Yes. Internet of cows, except they take a more practical approach. Like mm-hmm. they have little Bluetooth beacons uh, on mm-hmm. all the tags and around the farm, they have their own different sensors uh, and gateways. They actually, mm, they, yep, they actually yep. use thread in, in some of their products. Oh, cool. But the founder is a fantastic electrical engineer. They, they've hired a full-time web developer and they, they basically are a hardware company and they're using a platform today uh, that is, is sort of like the pipe between the device and the web developer, effectively. Yeah. It's yeah. the communication, it's the security, it's the software updates, it's getting the data to a point where the software developer, that sort of web developer type person, can do all the fancy graphics. But mm-hmm. all that hard part in the middle is is kind of the, the space where you have to you have to figure it out. Um, and we've yeah. been talking about that, the, the, the sort of part in the middle this whole time. Right, and so one thing that I, so I actually don't know this example John's talking about, just so we're clear, I'm not like trying to, <laughs> blow in his thing. But one solution I've heard for that is like you use free RTOS, right? So now you're at the low level of your device. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They've got, they're owned by Amazon now. They're, they've got all these hooks into AWS. And then like Amazon's like, yeah, we'll do everything for you, man. We'll yep. just, you know, we'll push updates. We'll, you know, they're trying to do everything in between. Yep, yep, but like yep. we talked about before then, it's like, okay, you can do that. But what if you're not allowed to use Amazon now? Or what if you, you know, what if something happens, you are locked into that ecosystem all the way down to the silicon, it feels like. Yeah. So that 
could be problematic. That's kind of the starting point, right? Uh, free RTOS, great RTOS. We use it at Particle. <clears throat> I know it pretty well. But uh, if Amazon free RTOS and the Amazon IoT stack doesn't have a supported you know, module for your the one you're choosing, uh, well, then what mm -hmm. do you do? So you're even yeah. you're even kind of um, in a, a challenge in the beginning. Uh, let's say you want to use um, uh, NRF ninety one sixty, the the cellular modem from Nordic, and you want to use well, it's a cellular product, so you want to save as much bandwidth as possible. Well, uh, Amazon has some sort of uh, IoT gateway. It implements one protocol, but uh, this exact use case, they're trying to save you know bytes, right? Yeah, right. And so Amazon doesn't support the protocol that they want to support, which will get down to that, you know, that cost savings. And so mm -hmm. the recommendation from Amazon, and, this, and I say, kind of say that in, in jest, was like, oh, just go build your own IoT gateway and then talk to the rest of Amazon. It's like, this <laughs> electrical engineer who has one software developer is looking right, at exactly. this recommendation and says, I, I can't afford that. Not only right. can I not afford that, I don't even know who to hire. How do I evaluate yeah, what is, what is that position, right? Yes. What, what does the job rack look like? I, I don't know either. I, yeah. Honestly, it's like uh, someone who's built something, <laughs> software person yeah. with knowledge of hardware, hopefully. <laughs> it actually turns out to be a similar problem for enterprises, so bigger companies, the, the John Deere's and 3M's of the world. Uh, the number one problem that they, at least they document in, in all these surveys, is they don't know who to hire or they don't have the internal resources yeah. to, to build their IoT pilot. And so they just, mm. they just don't. They just don't. They don't do it, or they don't hire, or yeah. what they don't do. Okay. Yeah, they, the 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 stat that floats around, depending on, on who's recording, is like seventy six percent of, of pilots fail um, in IoT because of X, Y, and Z reasons. And one of the number one reasons is because either they didn't demonstrate the ROI, and, and they usually blame it because we just gave it to our IT team and and told them to take this money and and, and figure it out. And well, they they didn't figure it out, or it was just not in their scope of expertise. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting too, the the tie into IT, right? So like, I think at the corporate level, a lot of companies think about like, oh, well, there's internet involved. We're going to have our IT team involved. And like, and there is often expertise there, yeah. but like, then I've seen some of the products that are offered to IT groups, like targeted, like solutions that are targeted at IT groups. And one example was like, a, uh, I'd seen, a, I think Sprint had a, uh, uh, a LoRaWAN solution, mm -hmm. and it was like six hundred dollars for two devices that talked over LoRaWAN, and it was just like that was the answer. And I was like, "What? No, that's that's not the. An I mean, like that might be the answer, but that's all you got. Like it just it just seemed like so, like the the actual like need that that group would have versus what was offered. It was just like so expensive, and I don't. I think it was specifically because they were targeting an IT group, and there wouldn't be that that hardware piece and that in between piece. Yeah, and, and oftentimes those type of products were are designed in a vacuum. They said, "Well, we our sales team is telling us that lower is a thing. Let's go find yeah, a, right. a white labeled solution and, and resell it." Yeah. Yep. Yep. But somewhere down the business line, let's say in a logistics group within uh, the company, uh, they're like, "Oh, actually, we we need to know which which building this device is in, and we have all these use cases and how we'd actually take advantage of it." The role of IT in that world is actually integrating. Mm, yeah, right, right. The people like boots on the ground, like installing, under getting the products up, understanding what's talking where. Like, yeah, it's very critical, it feels like. So IT, and I'm going to use that term loosely for anyone who's listening who's in IT. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it cares about IoT. IT cares about IoT uh, for, for really two things. Sorry, three. Set up and installing the device, um, managing the device and, you know, taking devices offline, security, whatever, and then integrating into some sort of business process. Uh, so that's taking the data and associating it with a building inside your internal, you know, building management software, or if it's a fulfillment center, um, associating with some customer data. But all the stuff we just talked about for the last hour has nothing to do with any of that. Right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, they expect like data like they see it in, from anything else, right? I mean, they expect like they want to see data in a database or whatever else, right? So when it's like IT led solutions for IoT hardware and all that, it's just completely the wrong, the wrong, the wrong story, the wrong customer, the wrong um, set of features. As long as you have, as long as you make them happy, well, then you can sell. And this is kind of a lot of our conversations is to the hardware engineer at a company, or maybe it's the R and D team that has electrical mm -hmm. engineer and uh, you know embedded developer on, as as a consultant. Yeah. They're the ones who need to be building up the what I, what <laughs> I would call like. The hardware side of things, right? And the connectivity and yeah, they got to be clued in first. It feels like because otherwise you're just going to be throwing data at some endpoint 
and then like just hoping that they can that whoever's using this at the end of the day is can understand what that thing is. Yeah, and actually the most interesting thing going to enterprise conversations is right now the world of managing your device and your fleet of devices, especially as you scale up, is actually owned by the, the software team. So if you built that hardware and you're making sure it's running lay software, you really only are you know allowed access in a very uh, like hands-off way because AWS is owned mm-hmm. by the rest of the software team. Oh yeah, right. But you really you're responsible for that device, and when it goes wrong or if there's a breach, it's like everyone look at the you know the hardware division in the company. And mm. so h- how do you actually enable that group to have its own control and um, tools that don't require them to have their own AWS account, but but still be able to do all the software things they need to do to to keep those devices online and, and healthy? Yeah, and that's actually one thing that I I was very confused about when I was coming into the cellular space. I was very confused about that whole like fleet management side of things. It's not mm-hmm. really something I'd ever thought about. But that's something that Particle actually does really well, I think, which is like, okay, you've got, now you're deploying 10,000 devices, right? Like in in the scope of things, you know, for an individual, that's a big deployment for a company. That's probably a medium to small deployment. Okay. But like, how do you know that all 10,000 are healthy and online and like what the serial number is and what the SIM card number is and all of these different things and like actually managing those devices individually is, is a whole different layer that's different from... Now the end customer who actually has one of those 10,000 devices on their site, they actually don't care that the, they just assume that the device is online and that the SIM card is installed correctly and is getting data and everything else. And they just care about the web interface that lets them yep. talk down to exactly. that device. And so there's there's multiple like stages of that need to be able to interact with the actual hardware. And it sounds like the one you're talking about, the hardware person talking to the hardware, it's, it's kind of like a troubleshooting insight to that device and maybe maybe a maybe like a management panel or something similar to that yeah you actually hit on a bunch of good points because when when you're developing a device and actually operating the device that's really the the hardware team the embedded engineer who's doing software updates maybe there's a, a faulty device so they're collaborating with the electrical engineering team to try to triage one or two devices but all the fleet stuff that you talked about 95 percent is for a business person it's Either the the business owner of the division who's responsible for those devices, maybe you know at Particle, a lot of times our customer support team was in the dashboards for our customers looking at the fleets. Nothing to do with pushing yeah, firmware right. or you know IP addresses. So you actually have to have two very disparate types of feature sets just to get you know air quotes fleet management. Then you add cellular on top of it, and that's a whole other layer of like the fleet of sims and uh, which towers are connected to, what's the RSSI. And so uh, it, it's actually interesting because if you look at a lot of the brochures, they talk about the business owner and the graphs of up to the right and, you know, all these things and on a global dashboard. Mm-hmm. But if, 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 if it's Chris and, and it's your device on the field, you're like frantically in that, that website refreshing the page because it's not updating fast enough or uh, <laughs> trying to get access because you've now handed off to the customer. So there's actually even still specific challenges and, and, and things to solve for in fleet management for the embedded and hardware teams. Yeah. All right. Well, go ahead, fix it. Uh, how's it going to get fixed, John? Uh, yeah, we're, we're building a, a platform. We are <laughs> trying to solve this problem uh, from the, the way that I, I, only I know how, you know, build software, you know, leverage open source, be parts of community. At the end of the day, truly empowering the the, the hardware teams, the embedded engineers, the, the electrical engineers, and uh, that those rogue mechanical engineers who got stuck signing PCBs. <laughs> And and really really building the things that they need, not not what cloud companies um, are traditionally trying to solve for. And yeah, 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 yeah. It's, so okay, so the company's called uh, Goliath, and and it's spelled. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Goliath, the biblical uh, character, except it's G O L I O T H. It's I O T is in the middle, folks. Yeah, it has I O T. Either the logo mark is a little bit more obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I just definitely spelled it wrong like the first four times. And John's like, "Oh, I'm working on this thing called Goliath." I'm like, "Okay, I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing Bible story, Bible story, Bible." Yeah, like... <laughs> there's, a, there's a Netflix t- uh, TV show uh, that's supposed to be oh, pretty yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yep. Yeah, naming's hard. I don't know. It's yeah, like one it of those sucks. three hardest things in computer science. But no, uh, it, it, the don't worry about it. Our lawyers got it wrong the first time, so uh, yeah, it's that's all cool. good. But we are we're still in stealth. So obviously I'm here talking about it and, and definitely love to, to talk with more people, learn about their problems. Mm-hmm. We'll be opening up a developer community because it's again, at the end of the day, it's developers. It's the hardware engineers, the firmware engineers who are designing these products that will hopefully be our 
our customers and, and users. So in the future, we'll have that open and uh, looking for, for feedback on stuff. Yeah, that's definitely, we're going to definitely talk again about that on here because I cool. think that, I mean, the fact, the fact that you're, I haven't seen many other things targeting hardware developers specifically, right? So I, th I think Particle does, right? I think that they've done a, a good a good job of building up the ecosystem. It's like, hey, let's make it easy for you to blink that first LED, get it get it up and running, talking to the cloud. Like, and there, you know, there's that that same kind of magical thing of like, you know, when you click a button and it's talking over a cellular network without much hassle and you see the LED go off, like that's that's cool, man. Like yeah. that's really cool. Much like when Colin from punch through, mm -hmm. you know, they, they made that really easy with Bluetooth back yep. in the day too, yeah, yeah. with the, the light blue bean. And he's been on the show before. And I, I think that like those kind of things are targeted at hardware people. And it's like, those are really good starting places. And it's like, now, if you want to make it extensible, you want to like, say you have that same problem of like, you, you want to move outside the ecosystem. That's when it starts to get more difficult, I think. Right. Yeah. So that magical thing is magical because it's vertically integrated, right? It's they've taken care of everything under the hood, but you either have to stay in their ecosystem, pay for their ecosystem, or you know, deal with the constraints of their ecosystem. And if you're breaking out of that because so like in my case, if my client, uh, you know, so I I do a consulting project. I design a thingy, it's got particle in it, it's worked great, whatever. But now my client's like, okay, great. We want to run it on our, our own servers over here. It's like, I, yeah, yeah I got to start over, yep. you know, <laughs> like that's, and, and that's literally, and like, that's not like an exaggeration. That is literally what I've had to do before. Yep. And so, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, nothing, nothing uh, specifically a particle. This is any platform you choose to use. Yeah. Any vertically integrated part of their uh, ecosystem, I think, right? It, you talked about Amazon. Uh, if Amazon I, uh, AWS IoT meets your requirements, awesome. But if you're yep. operating in China, then you can't use AWS IoT in China. It's sort of a, a mm -hmm. non-starter yeah. uh, on the cloud yeah. side. And, and I would say right. in the beginning, particle is fantastic if you're trying to add hardware to your, yeah. to your software stack. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've used, I've used them to great effect many times. So like, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if if you live in the world of of, of KiCad and and you know doing free RTOS custom drivers, mm -hmm. you're you're starting to it's not the right path for you. Mm -hmm. And if you want to throw satellite modem, well, then that's the constraints of the platform. And so yeah. uh, we're hoping to, to 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 build something that can be used and and have some of that magic moments. But for people who are comfortable in that world, mm -hmm. yep, yep, definitely. Let's talk a little bit about. So you've written about CoApp. And I think we've actually mentioned on the show, you wrote a, a thing called the Field Guide to Co-App. And I don't know what that is, but I've heard you talk about it a couple of times. And I <laughs> feel like, I, I know we're not talking about Goliath specifically, but like, what is Co-App and why should we care about it? Yeah, and uh, it, there's all these technology wars, right? People talk about tabs mm -hmm. and spaces and, and KiCad and KiCad. <laughs> uh, well, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely mainstream already. But there are technology choices that are optimized uh, by the creators for some reason or the other. And mm -hmm. because of the system of systems, all parts of your system, there might be a better solution for what you're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about hardware, maybe cellular is great if there's no Wi-Fi available and you need to connect yeah. to the internet. Like that, that's sort of a, a self-selecting uh, feature. And there are different mm -hmm. protocols. Um, and this is one example of being locked in or, or sort of having a turnkey solution might not include all the protocols you need. And that's that's the way this device talks to the cloud and how the to cloud talks to the device. Uh, it's workflow for getting a software update or a configuration change. And it's almost a alphabet soup. Yeah, and oh, totally. Yeah. What I spent and got inspired by uh, working on protocol stuff at Nest was actually, if you understand why this thing was created, you might be able to use it in its intended purpose, but also choose it for the right job. So uh, mm, what I'm trying yeah. to do with this this blog series is just educate people on new protocols they may not be familiar with and show that, hey, there's actually differences. And if you have a platform that implements them, maybe you can choose that one over another one. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a general education of different protocols. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's good too. I mean, I think that is one of the hardest things about getting started in a lot of these things is that there are so many things out there. You need to almost have a library in your head I just did a contextual electronics podcast where uh, Timon and myself were talking about like the mechanical side of like having mm. a library of different mechanical like manufacturing methods and like that being a way 
to make a better product because you understand how things are put together and, and what's going to be the most efficient way of building. You need to know that like back when you're doing the CAD, you actually need to know, well, I'm going to be using sheet metal and a bending machine, or, you know, I'm going to be using like a wire cutter or something like that. But you need to have that end in mind. And it's really tough when people don't have that. It feels like this is kind of the same thing of now co-op or MQTT or what are all this alphabet soup, like you said, if you don't have at least a passing knowledge of like, well, it might be A, B, C, or D, all these different methods of doing a thing and what some of the trade-offs are, you can't make the decision all the way back on the silicon that you're choosing, right? Like I I think about one of the things that I was going to mention with the vertically integrated too is like one thing that I I recommend to people is that if you're going to choose an ecosystem that say, again, just to to use the the free RTOS with AWS stuff, if you're going to use that and you're going to use that because you like AWS IoT and you you're comfortable with free RTOS, I would take it a step further and say, use the silicon that's on the example chips. Don't even yep. move outside that. Yep. Don't yep. do not do work you don't have to. Yep. And you, you might be constraining yourself in one way, but if you can make it work, make that work specifically. If now you're going in the other direction, you're saying, okay, I have a chipset I want to use. Now go out and find all of the things that can work with that chipset and find all of the protocols that can talk to that, to that chipset, but also like talk to the software solutions that are running on that chipset and it's just yeah it's it's like a branching tree of never endingness yeah though no, i think you kind of summarized one of the key responsibilities or skills in engineering right it's building up mm-hmm. a database of yeah uh, technology options you don't have to become experts in them you don't have to know how to manufacture a you know a, a flathead screw but you have to know mm-hmm. why you would use that screw for its you know surface finish or whatnot mm-hmm. and that i think it's the same thing with protocols like like you mentioned with the blog post or even we talked about cellular a bunch you know what's the difference between cat m1 versus cat1 when would you use cat4 what's you know what's 6g it's it's a lot <laughs> but if you're starting to ask those questions either you have you've already done some research and you know that well i'm i have a bandwidth problem with using nbiot i actually need to stream you know images or whatnot so what are my other options yeah. so yeah having that um, information and i would say that it hasn't been so accessible Generally speaking, uh, what, when, what I'm trying to do is just say, okay, let me give you the TLDR of what you need to know, how it's useful, and how you can scroll that away for future for future use, and, and and actually take advantage of something that someone's already been thinking through and designing for for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be nice if there was literally like a what is what is that site? There's there's a like a how I it's not a how I built this, but it's like what's under the hood with like mm. oh, it's built with. I think it's built with dot okay. com. Yep, yep, yep. Is that it? Yeah, builtwith.com. And basically, it literally, like, you type in a web address and it tells you, like, oh, this is like a, you know, a Linux and Apache mm-hmm. and MySQL and PHP, right? A LAMP stack. And it's using this and it's got all these different plugins, whatever. Like, I wish there was that for hardware. That'd be really nice to be like, oh, the Nest thermostat is using, you know, this chipset and this and this and this and this. So if someone's out there listening, please go build that. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, or you know, just, just scrape, uh, I fix it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's great. I, I just need someplace to go and search. Because I would like to do the reverse search of that, right? I want to go and look at like, okay, now I'm going to search for everything that uses MQTT and FreeRTOS and AWS IoT and an ESP32. And I go and see all the devices that are out there. And if it's like, if I'm going to build an oil and gas thing and I don't see any oil and gas things on that list of things Mm -hmm. that are built with that, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's kind of telling, you know, that's (laughs) that's bad. Uh, So Yeah, and and I'll tell you, uh, maybe a dirty little secret, that a lot of companies use, big companies you'd be surprised, uh, mm-hmm. they look at the Xiaomi's and the um, uh, Tuya's of the world and see mm-hmm. what hardware they're using. Yeah, copy the, copy the crap out of it. Yeah, copy the crap. <laughs> and just because it's you know in a low-cost device doesn't mean it's not the right combination. And they'll mm-hmm. actually base designs off of those low-end you know, connected devices because mm-hmm. of the the volume, maybe because of software support is around it. Yeah, maybe the be- support's huge. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Or maybe they just want to go to the same ODM that 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 company is. So um, <laughs> right, right. it's actually a good skill set. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. So what is Coap though? Because you wrote about it, so I got to ask about it now. <laughs> well, you can just read the blog post. Oh, I'm come just on. kidding. I'm just kidding. But we don't have time to read. Uh, so it's it's one of those IoT protocols, and mm-hmm. I first learned about it maybe when I was in Nest or, or just before that. And it it's interesting because like other protocols like MQTT, it was designed for for a series of specific purposes. And it's actually really good at it if you understand those. Mm. And in particular, it's it's really uh, optimized for two two aspects. One is low power, low bandwidth. 
which is kind of one and the same, mm -hmm. and easy to program. So imagine the there's like a TLDR in the blog post. If you take like one one thing away, imagine if someone took like HTTP, so all the simple concepts you know how to like visit a website or build talk to a web server, but made mm -hmm. it for constrained devices. That's that's effectively what co-op is. Mm, okay. And why why doesn't that exist already though? I, I, or why didn't it exist? Uh, sorry, why doesn't that exist at a lower level? I suppose on devices. Well, it, it actually co-op is quite popular. Oh, okay. It's found a lot in um, cellular technology. So even the cellular technology itself, the way the providers provision each other and do roaming, actually parts of it uses co-op. But uh, part of the reasons is that impedance mismatch. The, the design of HTTP was designed for web browsers and talking to web servers. So of course they didn't optimize for you know a limited amount of RAM or a small mm -hmm. MTU size can, communications because that's not the constraints of HTTP was designed for. And so CoAP was just uh, an evolution of that saying, well, now we have a bunch of IoT devices. This was 2014, I think, when it was uh, formalized. Mm -hmm. And we want them optimized for reusing understanding. So make it as much like HTTP as possible. Mm -hmm. But we also know we might want to use it for cellular or for um, 802.15.4. So they optimize the different packets to, to be under the covers, uh, op, mm. you know, efficient that way. And so a, a lot of cellular deployments actually benefit from using co-op in, in lieu of HTTP. Mm, okay. And so when this thing talks to the internet then, again, so if there's some kind of like packet forwarding, like it's going to use this protocol and it's, is it still going to be like a TCP packet that talks like through a post request or something like that? At, at a super high level. I'm, I'm, cringing, I'm cringing as I'm saying this stuff because I'm pretty sure I don't know what I'm talking about. No, but... no, no, no. You actually know exactly what you're talking about. And that, that that's a really good way to phrase the question. And the way the way to create an analogy, and we can talk about MQTT in the same sort of analogy building structure. Mm -hmm. You have a browser and you're talking to a server. Or you have a you know Raspberry Pi and you're talking to an API. You okay. create a request, HTTP colon slash slash whatever. Um, that browser or that Raspberry Pi sends a request to that server at that location, and it responds back. The packets are form formulated in HTTP. Um, this, I'm not going to bore the audience with like the OSI stack all the way down to the bottom, but somewhere under the covers is using TCP, and below that is IP. Mm -hmm. But from a client-server perspective, you're just using HTTP back and forth. Um, CoAP is the replacement for that. So you can think of your tiny motion sensor posting a message to a server saying, hey, I was just opened, uh, or I was just moved. That's how you can interact with co-op. But at the same time, saving to 20 to 40% on bandwidth and or battery uh, for the exact same thing if it was, let's it. say, HTTP. OK, um, so like less, less extraneous information that a web browser might have that a little tiny device doesn't need kind of thing. Exactly. So it's like a slim, slimmed down version. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then okay. over time, they've added more features to build off of that sort of slimming down concepts to mm -hmm. just handle more use cases. It has security built in, and then they added extended security. Assume, you know, let's say you have a device that can do more, it it's, defines more. But the way I look at all protocols uh, as, as not a protocol expert is almost like an arbitrage opportunity because mm -hmm. CoAP, MQTT, AMPQ, OPC UA, all these other protocols which are, make up the alphabet soup were designed by PhDs. And a lot of them also have industry ex experience. And they wrote this all these experience down in a document that's 100 to you know 500 pages and published on the internet for free. Uh, uh -huh. And I look at it as like, oh, I can leverage this expertise by a building full of PhDs for free. Yep. So why not yeah. understand it and use it in the, to, in, the, in the way it was intended to? And it's almost like cheating a little bit. Yeah. I mean, when I think about all this stuff too, like when I think about how I, in a, in a very real way about how I work with this stuff and probably somewhere that is different than how you and I work is like, I wouldn't even consider switching outside of the known realm of like, like here's a vendor example. I'm just following the vendor example. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I just need to make sure it works. Like that's the main thing. And it's like, so now if it's using co-op, I don't care. You know, yep, if it yep, works, it yep. works. You know, that's what, that's what's important. And so now what I'm kind of hoping, even though you're not going to tell us much about what's uh, un under the covers of Goliath yet, what I'm hoping is that there's going to be some demos that are just working but also in these new ways and in these new like power efficient ways and firmware efficient ways and things like that. Yeah, I, I, I'll definitely confirm that. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, we got them, folks. We got them. It's, it's, it's more than that. It, it's not just, you know, get, you, want, you want the app note for, for IoT. It's yeah. giving you the tools to actually say, well, 
I don't care how this message is formatted. You just told me that it's efficient or whatever. Now let me program it the way I want to program it. So I want to use an RTOS and I'm using Zephyr. So how do we yep, make... Sounds familiar. Yep. <laughs> how do we make CoApp or, or other protocols like it accessible and easy to, to program against while still using the hardware and the, you know, the programming model that you want? So that's, that's definitely part of it. So there's, there's the programmability yeah. and the, the, the use of it that we're trying to solve for. Yeah, I think the the thing that I like have liked about Zephyr so far is that it's like you kind of you get the it's not getting it for free, but it's like it's already built into the system. It's tested, you know. Like that's one of the benefits that I've seen about it so far is that like they abstract away some of the hardware stuff, so you, you know there's more to get the hardware up and running into this ecosystem. But then once you're there, you have all these like plug on module type of things and. If there's a new way to transmit information more efficiently or whatever, I'll just be able to dial into that and, yep. and just use that that yep. new efficient way of doing things because it's honestly because of all this stuff, it's it's because the software methodologies are coming down to the hardware. And it sounds like what you're gonna be doing is now going the other direction and saying, Okay, yeah, we got these software methodologies. Let's use that for the hardware and then optimize in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, I'm I'm older, but not not quite old enough to be there for the the early RTOS, you know, wars where you had to dev- you know design your own uh, UART driver and your own you know tick uh, system for your own RTOS. Where mm. you know there's there's good operating systems and RTOSs that are available now, whether they're open source or not, is it's kind of a side point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like money is usually like if you're at this scale, like the money piece is is really not that big a deal. Yeah, it feels like. But what's interesting about I would say. Zephyr and a few other um, implementations of its generation is that internet is part of it because there was a time and still uh, where like FreeRTOS doesn't have an IP stack, doesn't have even a concept of networking. Oh. And so the, the FreeRTOS creators created um, that solution partially because the majority of embedded systems that had an RTOS was not a connected device. It was a medical device. It was a Bluetooth uh. headset. Etc. And so they came a little bit earlier. So therefore, there was there's no concept. With is there now? Is there now an IP stack? I mean, obviously they can talk to AWS and stuff. But like, is that bolted on, or is it actually like integral to the piece to the like free RTOS now? Uh, I think it's, a, it's somewhere in between. Um, it was designed specifically for free RTOS, so it, it looks and feels and is part of the system. But there are some aspects of Zephyr being designed from the beginning specifically to have flexibility and all the APIs to be consistent and thinking through how an IP stack might be running on a device that also has an ASIC that's its networking mm-hmm. stack. All those pieces are just from the beginning. And so you, you yeah. end up having a, a just a cleaner, um, tighter integration. Yeah. So it wasn't like, was, wasn't Mongoose meant as like a internet first kind of thing as well, like a RTOS, but like... Yeah. Yeah. So the, the history of, of IoT RTOS is there were... I think Kentiki was was one of the first. Oh yeah, not yep, the first okay. one. Mostly academic, uh, partially because there wasn't a lot of hardware that it could work with. Um, Riot OS is another really good, really solid one that's built for IoT. I think because it has IoT in the name. <laughs> and I want I want to say NutX, and these are these are examples of oh, open yeah. source. And yeah. all most of the commercial there hasn't been a new commercial open source uh, RTOS as far as I know in, in the last couple of years. And so they all have um, networking and. Uh, industri- industrial protocols uh, added on to it, but um, very few are really optimized for the you know, connected connected uh, use case. So mm-hmm. I think there will be more RTOS in the future, and I'm pretty sure they'll all be IoT first, if, if not foremost, but it does have an advantage uh, for, in particular Zephyr uh, of being designed from end to end that way. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, it, and and it, from my experience, you know, I'm working with a firmware developer who I've mentioned on the show before, but like mm-hmm. the from my experience of like hooking in the hardware piece, that is not simple, right? I mean, like it's it's definitely different than like, you know, grabbing a vendor library that's already designed for the chip you're using, whatever. It's more Linux style interconnecting type of stuff, which Bilal did and I did not. Uh, so I should be clear about that. <laughs> uh, but once that is there, then it's like, okay, now we have access to the suite of tools that are in there. And I, I assume it's the same for NutX and Riot and Mongoose and everything yeah, else too. Yeah. One of the, the 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 tech leads at, at Nest used to call used to hate the term RTOS, and he's like, yeah, the real time part is is, is the most inconsequential aspect. Yeah, right. So he 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 referred to them as either HALs or PALs, hardware abstraction uh, layers or, or platform abstraction layers, and you'll see that oh, in I like that yeah. in, in docs because effectively it's what you described, 
uh, on instead of registers, it's UARTs, um, or instead yeah. of TCP IP, it's you know this TCP library Net- network dot connect or yeah, whatever, it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you know, to be fair, that there's abstractions on top of it, like a mongoose, which is an abstraction on top of I think Fjartos. Oh, okay. But it's it's you know choosing where you are in that uh, abstraction layer is important because uh, if you're implementing a custom protocol, like what do we call it, uh, a- the ABCP, uh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you, you, you can't be at you know Wi-Fi dot connect. You, you have to be at you know socket dot open. Mm, yeah. And so that's where most of the the RTOS is. They they kind of sit in that socket dot open. Right. What is the the primitive you need? That's like that's a really good uh, yeah delineation. I think you know mm-hmm. like of like yeah you're connecting to it. You're not just giving it an APN and just everything's taken care of for you, right? You're like uh, nope. Okay, let's let's just shepherd this whole thing to make sure we're talking to the server we want through and or talking to the you know getting connected to the access point and and uh, all the way through to the actual sending packets type of thing. Yeah. It's been my experience that you that's really good design that way because the library that you know is, is doing the U blocks you know uh, twiddling of bits might be different for you than for me or maybe you know proprietary in nature. So without having that low enough API in in, in the in the the PAL or the RTOS mm-hmm. kind of prevents you from actually doing those the, the sort of thousand flowers right. bloom. Yeah, but right. fortunately for you know noobs like me, uh, you don't have to implement that because that's already done and that's pretty much out of the box in uh, Nartos or some other ecosystem. And that's why ecosystems matter. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and again, I think that in that case, like the out of the box that like you're talking about, that kind of goes back to the, if you're using the hardware that's already optimized for it. If you're outside of that like flow path diagram, right, of like, okay, NRF 52840 using Zephyr, using this, this, and this, it's like, okay, it's going to work for that probably. And you'll have enough trouble getting that up and going and fine. I've had a lot of trouble getting that up and going, but now it's like, you want to make a custom. Now you're moving outside the path and there's just more resistance. You know, it's like you're, you're in like a jet stream. And if you want to go outside the jet stream, you might, you might, uh, so it's like about finding the right jet stream first, it feels like. Yep. And then yep. S- kind of sticking with it and, and understanding the risks of going outside of it. Yeah. I, and I think, I think that's, that's been generally my experience in platforms, like whether it's hardware or software, you know, do you do you are you the type of person or you find yourself in problems where you look for where's the porting guide or where's the mm-hmm. hello world right <laughs> yeah and when I, when and when I get to a project or a product and and I, I say look through their documentation and their their sales pitch or whatever if I'm looking for the porting guide it, it's probably the wrong the wrong tool for the job um, pretty quickly yeah. or like right, oh right. do you want to build your own server from scratch let's let's show you how to invent a programming language first before you can <laughs> what's right, the right. apple pie analogy. Um, right, right. To first to bake an apple pie, first you must invent the universe. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so that's 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 actually probably the biggest challenge of any platform um, is right. finding the right balance between abstraction and and control. Mm, yeah, I think yeah, and I mean to take it all the way back to the beginning too of like companies coming in too. I I, I feel like the biggest companies might have the the hardest time with it too. Like I think about how Apple operates, and mm-hmm. not specific to this example, but like Apple looks at a problem and they're like we're probably doing 99% custom, right? They're mm-hmm. like, yeah, we're going to use some silicon that's off the shelf. I mean, not 99%, but we're going to use a, a, a measurable amount of custom things in this device because we're at the scale where that's negligible and you know we can we can stomach the cost of tooling and everything else. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you talk about a two-person company like your, your friend you talked about. It's like, there's a very little chance that you're going to do anything custom because it's a huge risk to do that. Yep. Yep. And so that's where it feels like the push and pull of like, going for a platform versus going for, you know, starting your own programming language or whatever from scratch. And it's like, it's all of it's possible, but there's definitely trade-offs in, in each case. Yeah. And, and kind of the beginning story of the, the fire detection system, you really have to start with the problem you're trying to solve. If you're a two person mm-hmm. company and you're trying to sell to a handful of, uh, of, of firefighters as quickly as possible, then mm-hmm. You're probably going down the wrong path. You'll never get to those ten, you know, those ten sales. Mm-hmm. And it's sometimes a trade-off between do we design this, knowing that we're gonna have to redesign it now. Oftentimes, you usually should take the path of least resistance if you want to get an mm-hmm. idea off the ground. Yeah. It's, and you know, the other thing with something like an Apple, a company like Apple, they have decades of experience to get yeah, to that right. scale. That they, that's right. a no-brainer. Uh, conversation they know before they even start a product right some of their like values. so and it's uh, and it's competitive advantage to do so right i mean it's like literally you buy yourself time on you know copycats and everything else yeah, right you yeah. actually have that expertise but, but i will say that just like any other hardware 
individual startup company, they have platforms of choice, right? They, they have chips that they, they lean on and uh, they have patterns. And uh, if, if their internal platform team doesn't support uh, the thing they want to use, a new thing, then they have the same exact struggle that we just talked about. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, on the uh, mismatched uh, uh, expectations. Oh, impedance mismatch. Yeah, well, sort of that, but like on the hardware thing specifically, like mm -hmm. I went and talked to someone and it was actually interviewing for a job that I decided not to take, but he's like, we were talking about cellular solutions and, and all this other stuff. And, and he's like, yeah, this is someone who's an expert in the industry and he's been around for a long time. He's like, yeah, I was just, I, I would go chip down every single time. Right. So like in the case of putting a cellular thing on board, he would literally go and buy a Qualcomm chipset and put that on the board and build up everything around that the entire rf front end he would do it all custom whatever he's like yeah i would never do a module or anything like that yeah and you know i ingested what he said and i was very impressed by it and then later he's like oh yeah so you brought some hardware you wanted to show me what did, what did you do and i pull out my hardware with a, a quectel modem on it i'm like or a quectel module i'm like yep i used a module yeah <laughs> but it was the right it was the right choice for me. And yeah. like, he understood that, but it was just like this, this great, uh, contrast of, of, uh, someone doing industrial electronics such as myself versus someone who did literally millions of devices for a single product. And it was just like, oh yeah, well, well, and also, also keep in mind that he is just doing the chip up design. He's probably not doing any of the testing because he's a company that has enough testers. Mm -hmm. He's not yep. doing the, 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 like the front end part of that chip up design. Uh, yep. he's yep. not writing firmware. Yeah, yeah, he's he was the hardware RF guy. He just did he did the the layout and the you know the RF stuff and everything else was a team team effort with a big company. Instead of trying to get to, you know ten firefighters to buy your product, he's trying to get the cost down. So he's optimizing for something completely right. different. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's a fair trade off. Yeah, yeah, a lot of lot of trade offs, a lot of trade offs. Well, we've talked about a lot of things here, John. I've been musing what we're going to call this show. I still don't sure what we're going to call this show. I feel like musing IOT would be kind of like a, a good overarching topic, but that probably will not get many people to listen here. So we'll, <laughs> we'll come up with like a snappy title after, after we're done here. What else should people know about you though? And maybe where you're going in the future? Yeah. Uh, you can find me on different platforms, mostly on Twitter. I'm also in a bunch of different Slack groups for hardware folks like Zephyr Slack. You can find me. There's a new Slack for the interrupt. The folks that, um, uh, I'll, 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 the new harder Slack uh, that just came out uh, online. I haven't heard about this one. This is exciting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm blanking for what they do. Uh, their startup that does um, crash analytics for hardware. My gosh. Oh, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a link for their their company and their their new Slack. And yeah, uh, we'll be kind of love to hear from anyone who builds hardware who's looking to build connected products. I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. If any of this resonates with you and you, you, you'd want to use this one day, we'll, we'll be opening up our, our developer preview soon. Please reach out to me. Sign up on the mailing list is what he meant to say here yeah. as the CEO of Goliath. He meant to say, go to Goliath.io and sign up so you stay up to date with announcements plus progress. <laughs> so you're hired, Chris. Thanks. Uh, thanks for okay. Yeah, there you go. PR guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really excited. I mean, uh, the, the conversations that John and I have had over time, it's like we enjoy getting together and talking about how IO2 sucks but John's actually doing something to fix it. And so <laughs> I'm very confident that he will. And yeah, I, I'm excited to see what you're going to build next. Awesome. Well, you know, it's it's all from the pain points that I've experienced and I've seen. That's right. And we just want to make, make, make cool stuff. <laughs> all right, we'll do that. All right, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Chris. This episode about making IoT suck less is brought to you by a community of electronics denizens helping the world of podcasting suck less, our patrons. You can join the fray at patreon.com slash the amp hour and join our rowdy discord discourse. <laughs>